On the morning of September the 21st, 1952, the body of mobster Eugenio Giannini was found on 107th Street. Deported mob powerhouse Charlie Luciano is believed to have ordered the murder from Naples, Italy. But what did Eugenio Giannini do to incur the wrath of the man known on the street as Charlie Lucky? Let's check it out. Welcome to OC Shorts, bringing you detailed historical snapshots of the American Mafia and other organised crime. Feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. Today we're going to take a quick look at the murder of mobster Eugenio Giannini and the involvement of deported mob heavyweight Charlie Luciano. Eugenio Giannini, sometimes referred to as Eugene, was born in Bari in 1906. Along with his parents, he moved to New York City when he was still young. Sources vary regarding whether the Giannini family settled in Harlem, the Bronx or in Greenwich Village. Giannini did a stint as a boxer in his teenage years and some reports state that he won 13 victories by knockout. At some point he made a move into a life of crime and in 1927 served time for robbery in Newport, Rhode Island. The following year, in 1928, he was arrested for carrying a revolver and was sentenced to 5-10 to ten years in Dannemora prison. It appears that while in Dannemora, Eugene Giannini made some connections and went back on the streets, formed a crew with several ex danamora inmates, including Ralph Delilio. On May the 4th, 1934, Eugene Giannini, along with Ralph Delilio, Alfred Lucci and one other, robbed a grocery store belonging to Leonard and Arizio Mangano at 83 Oliver Street in the Lower East Side. They seized the store's takings for that day, coming to a total of $147. The thieves made their escape from the shop, but Arizio Mangano shouted after them and threw a bottle in their direction, causing the robbers to run. As the gang bolted up the street, police patrolmen Arthur P. Rasmussen approached the corner of Oliver Street and saw the robbers hurtling towards him, desperately trying to get to their getaway car. Upon seeing the patrolman, the gang opened fire. Shots were exchanged, but sadly the police officer was hit three times in the jaw, chest and abdomen. He died of his injuries on the way to Beekman Street Hospital after being bundled into a taxi by onlookers. Two weeks later, the police had rounded up Giannini, Delilio, and Lucci. It was Ralph Delilio who was first picked up and rolled over on his accomplices. He would eventually be sentenced to 30 years in prison for the murder of patrolman Rasmussen. Records, however, indicate that Eugenio Giannini had managed to avoid any prison time for the robbery and murder, which also left three civilians wounded in the shootout. One newspaper reported, Three persons injured during the gun battle, in which the policemen and the thugs exchanged more than a dozen shots, were 10-month-old Thomas Farina of 15 Oak Street, shot in the cheek. Lenora Albanese, 16, of 34 Cherry Street, paralysed from a bullet in the spine. And Joseph Gaito, 17, of 78 Navy Street, Brooklyn, wounded in the forehead. Anyway, a few years later after this, Eugene Giannini would become affiliated with Cosa Nostra. Mob turncoat Joe Valacci would later indicate that Eugenio Giannini was inducted into the Lucchese crime family, whereas some sources link him with the then Luciano family. Either way, Giannini became involved in narcotics and would work with traffickers including Big John Ormento and Salvatore Sally Shields Shilatani of the Lucchese family, as well as Joe Valacci from the Genovese family, as it is now known. He would also work with Giacomo Rayner, son of slain mob boss Tommy Rayner, who had been gunned down in 1930. Throughout the 1940s, Eugenio Giannini would have interest in several legitimate businesses, including restaurant supplies and garbage collection as well as the usual illegitimate sources of income, including gambling, loan sharking and narcotics. 
In 1950, Eugenio Giannini would start to take regular trips to Europe regarding narcotics trafficking. And on one trip to Paris to meet with his Corsican connections, he then drove down to Naples to visit with Charlie Luciano, who allegedly had been controlling a massive heroin trafficking network. In the much discredited book, The Last Testament of Lucky Luciano, Charlie Luciano recalls, After I got to Naples in 1950, this guy Giannini come down to see me one day from Rome. He brought me some money from New York and a couple of messages from Tommy Lucchese and other guys. In 1951, on one of Giannini's trips to Europe, he was stopped at a checkpoint at San Remo and arrested on suspicion of supplying counterfeit money. It turns out that the authorities had received the tip-off regarding Giannini and the counterfeit money by another New York gangland figure who was now based in Italy after a deportation, Dominic the Gap Petrelli, a mobster who went back to the early days of the mob and had allegedly been friends with Charlie Luciano. Whilst Giannini was being held in a prison in Naples, he started writing letters to Charles Siragusa, the Italian director of the FBN, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. It turns out that Eugenio Giannini had been a confidential informant for several years, and he was hoping that this would help get him released. One of the letters that Giannini sent to Charles Siragusu contained information and knowledge regarding his transactions with Charlie Luciano. And he stated that if the FBN assisted him, he could provide more information linking Luciano to narcotics deals. In this particular letter, Eugenio Giannini finished it off with, Destroy this letter after reading it. If it gets into the wrong hands, I might as well buy a slot in a cemetery. In 1952, Eugenio Giannini went to trial in Italy on his counterfeiting charges. But the case was dismissed for lack of evidence. Due to the amount of heat that his old narcotic trafficking pals were getting back in New York City, he decided not to return immediately and even tried to apply for Italian citizenship. However, the FBN got wind of this and soon deported Giannini back to New York. Eugenio Giannini landed back in New York in April 1952. He would have five months left to live. In late summer 1952, Luciano family soldier and future mob turncoat Joseph Alacci was approached by his captain, Anthony Tony Bendestrollo, who told him that Eugenio Giannini had been marked for death. Joe Valacci was slightly annoyed because Giannini had owed him some money. Valacci would later recall in his testimony to the US Senate. Around that time, Tony Bender sent for me. I met him in Thompson Street in a restaurant called Rocco's. I sat at a table and he told me that word came from Charlie Lucky that Giannini is an informer. So I said, there goes my couple of thousand that he owes me. So it appears that Charlie Luciano from Italy had sent a message to Vito Genovese who then passed on the order to kill Giannini to Tony Bender. Anthony Tony Bender Strollo would later tell Joe Valacci that they were having problems in locating Giannini. And so Joe Valacci offers to take on the hit. Something that Tony Bender tells him he would have to get authorised. Joe Valacci recalls his conversation with Anthony Strollo. He said, well, I will have to talk to the old man about that meaning Vito Genovese, of course. So the next night I met him and he told me that Vito Genovese liked the idea. And so Valacci got his approval to handle the hit. He recruited his nephew, an up-and-coming mobster called Fiore Oceano, along with the Pagano brothers, Joe and Pat, a pair of future Genovese family captains. Despite what Tony Bender said, Locating Eugenio Giannini wasn't difficult at all. This led Valacci to speculate that Tony Bender had deliberately been dodging responsibility for the hit, or potentially insulating himself further by passing on the order. Joe Valacci stated that he simply picked up the telephone and called Giannini, and the pair met for drinks. Joe Valacci then met up with Giannini on a second occasion, 
and this time introduced him to Joe Pagano. And Valachi even lent Giannini $100. All these meetings with Giannini were part of the ruse to make him feel at ease, as well as allowing Joe Pagano an opportunity to put a face to the man that they were about to kill. Valachi learned that Giannini had been working as a drop escort for a dice game. Essentially, meeting with prospective gamblers at a designated location, checking them out, and then escorting them to the game. Allegedly, under the pretense of being interested in the dice game, Joe Pagano, along with his brother Pat and Valachi's nephew, Fioreciano, met with Giannini at a drop on the 20th of September 1952. They walked with him in the direction of the dice game, and when they were near the venue on 112th Street, one of the mobsters shot Giannini twice in the head with a 38. The shooter is believed to have been Fiore Sayano, who was keen to prove himself. Sayano, along with the Pagano brothers, Joe and Pat, would all be inducted into the Luciano crime family in 1954. All were sponsored by Joe Valacci. Whereas the Pagano brothers would both go on to become captains in what became known as the Genovese family, Fiore Siano's mob career was cut short. After his induction, he was sentenced to eight years in prison for narcotics trafficking. And then, after his uncle Joe Valacci had turned informer, people recalled seeing Siano walking around with a ghost-like expression. In 1964, he was met by three men at Patsy's Pizzeria on First Avenue, escorted out and never seen again. Some speculate that the elder Cosa Nostra family members believed that Siano had bad blood running through his veins due to what his uncle did. Two of the three men who escorted him to his death are believed to have been the Pagano brothers. Despite being shot near 112th Street, Giannini's body was found on 107th Street. Valacci stated that this was because some other drop escorts found his body and had tried to get him to Flower and Fifth Avenue Hospital but he had died en route, so they ditched the body. As mentioned, it is commonly thought that Charlie Luciano had ordered Giannini's killing from Italy. However, there is another theory. Some state that Giannini had swindled fellow mobsters out of $100,000 from a drug deal, and that Tony Bendestrollo, ever the snake, had only told Valacci part of the story when relaying the fact that Giannini had to be killed. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.